स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया वेलकम टू दी सीरीज ऑफ लेक्चर्स ऑन कॉर्नल डिजिटल नेटवर्क्स CNNs are basically a special class of artificial neural networks that we've seen the regular neural networks which expect images as input um, they are designed to designed to work on images um, mostly to handle computer vision problems like uh, artificial neural network that you have seen before the regular artificial neural network these networks also have weights neurons and bias units and the weights in these cnns are also estimated by optimizing a, an appropriate objective function because the input to these image uh, to these networks or images it allows for um, two things one is sparse connections we'll see what those are later as we progress as well as parameter sharing and because because the images are used as input these two or these two uh concepts are possible basically it is possible to have sparse connections as well as weight sh sharing of weights between the output neurons in a layer cnns in the recent past and of course uh, especially since deep learning has taken off has found huge applications basically in image recognition object detection localization semantic seg segmentation and medical image analysis these are some of the areas where cnns have shown extremely good performance um, on many benchmark problems and are now being tried out for many commercial applications so for instance let's look at this particular uh, application so this is a image um, from the wild it's a image showing a rural scene somewhere uh, and if this image is given as input uh, to the um, google clouds vision program it's really available you can also try it out then it automatically gives you describes the image as saying it's a herd with a 91% probability that it has goats in them and there is actually a herder in there it also identifies grass it also says livestock in this case okay and that this guy is the man in the picture is actually herding so this level of detail is possible this is the level of performance is possible with current cnns uh, here is an output from uh, another uh, cnn from silver pond it's an object detector so it's able to identify the man in the picture as well as the goat however it does label it wrongly as i think a horse okay so it is able to localize as well as identify the objects okay it's a typical application that you would do with a Uh, in computer vision that's what you is a typical application in computer vision and it's not too hard to think of some very you know uh, what everybody now talking now talking about the self driving cars you can see that if you have a vision system in a self driving car you can if it performs well that can it can identify obstacles or you know it can identify a pedestrians or signals or lights zebra crossings etc and act accordingly so this is a typical um, application in computer vision cnns also find applications in image analysis and in this case we are looking specifically at medical image analysis so if you look at this image here on the left it's an image of a brain mr image of the brain it's been pre processed to some extent so you can see some uh, you know abnormalities here and there okay and what you see on the right what you see on the right here are basically the pixel labeling tasks done by the done by a cnn where it correctly correctly identifies or to fairly large fairly correctly identifies regions that appear abnormal the various color schemes here correspond to different types of classes within the abnormality itself okay um this is a huge is a huge advantage in terms of uh, at least in medical image analysis wherein you know this is just one slice in a brain so a typical image a medical image will have hundreds of such slices going through a particular anatomy 
and going through them manually and labeling each of these voxels by hand is pretty much very tedious and a very error prone task. So, this can actually serve as a huge support for radiologists who can who look at these kind of images every day for interpreting them and diagnosing patients. So, what we have here are representative images from the ImageNet database. Now, this ImageNet challenge is a visual recognition challenge has been going on for quite a few years now. Basically, the challenge organizers make available to you millions of images drawn from the wild from the internet and labeled by, ex, by experts as belonging to one of thousand categories. And the challenge is to create a visual machine learning or an AI system that when given an input image from a test set, you again containing several hundreds of thousands or millions of images, uh, a test image is able to correctly classify it. Okay. So, shown on the shown here are several images. So, this is actually image of a side winder I have already marked it with red and this is actually marked as a hatchet that is the correct label the blues show the correct label. Okay. And this is again a, sh uh, a shipwreck I actually do not know what that is, but anyway. So, and these are some of the predictions made by a typical network which is trained on the database. Um, the challenge is that the correct class should be among the top 5 predictions of your system. Okay. So, over the last few years these um, CNNs have been have proven to have outperformed many other uh, systems AI systems trained for this task. The human error rate itself is around 5, 5 to 6 percent and there are now uh, large CNNs deep CNNs which outperform this. So, for instance, if you look at the accuracy of some of the these are the names of the diff given to different convolutional networks by the authors who built them or the people who worked on them. Uh, the top 5 accuracy if you see is just pretty impressive it is almost about 95 to 96 percent which is approaching human top 5 accuracy. Okay. Uh, we will see what these mean the parameters of the network the depth we will see later what it means, but parameters of the network are basically the number of weights in the network they range from a million to 140 million. Okay. So, over time people have uh, you know started with start off with a very large number of weights and over time the networks have uh, trimmed down they have gone deeper, but they have managed also to reduce the number of parameters in the uh, in the network and also improve the top fair accuracy. Okay. Okay. So, before we move on to what CNNs do and how uh, how to uh, build your own CNN uh, let us look at how images are parameterized. Okay. So, we saw earlier that CNNs take images as input. So, what does it mean? So, you know that for an artificial neural network the input is usually a vector, a vector of values or labels or some categorical label if you want. But uh, as far as a CNN is concerned a convolutional neural network is concerned the image the image is an input. So, there are different types of images grayscale as well as RGB. So, what do you mean by saying a gray uh, image as input? So, if you take a grayscale image here is a digit image image of a digit um, 8. So, you can think of the image as being made up of. So, this is actually a matrix. So, this is actually a matrix. So, 2D matrix. Okay. So, 2D matrix and the image is made up of pixels with each pixel have having a particular numerical value. So, this whole image is actually a 2D matrix and if you can think of it as like a grid I can, I can draw some crude grid like structures here. And so, very coarse view of the image. So, at to each grid point I there, there is a numerical value associated with it. So, that is the pixel value. So, in a typical image for instance the images that you take with your camera the images that you take with your camera the values of the pixels range from 0 to 255 they are referred to as 8 bit images. And the dimensionality of the input is basically the size of your 2D matrix. So, if you may you might have n x pixels on the x axis and n y pixels on the y axis. So, your image input is of size n x times n y. 
this is your input to a new network. If you want to think of it in terms of an artificial uh, neural network, the, your regular artificial neural network, you have an input vector of size. n x times n y. To give an example, MNIST database has digits, the images of digits which are of size 28 by 28 pixels. So, that means it is a four vector of size 484. Okay. So, as far as grayscale images is concerned, you can think of them as a 2D matrix. Uh, of dimension n x cross n y depending on how many pixels are there along the x or the y axis. And if you want to think in terms of a regular a n n, the size of your input is basically the total number of pixels in the image. Okay. Now, images we, we are by images we also mean R G B images. In that case, let us take a color R G B images are basically your typical color images. If you take an R G B image, we can extract the individual channels in RB, RGB image. So, the an RGB image consists of three channels R, G and B. Each channel itself is, each channel is an image. So, and we, the val, pixel values in each of the channels range from 0 to 255. A com, so, what you get as an RGB C as visualized as an RGB image is basically the combination of these uh, RGB pixel values. So, if you want to give so far, if you want to give a CNN an RGB image as out uh, as input, which means that so you have for every image nx pix, ny nx nx times ny pixels as input. However, there are also three cha three channels as they are called, as the terminology typically used uh, in CNNs. So your input is basically nx cross ny cross three size of your input. Once again as before if you want to think in terms of regular ANNs you have to um, rasterize the image and make it into a vector of size n x times n y times 3. So, the CNN basically takes if you can generalize CNN basically takes a volume as input by volume I mean that you have a you have a pixel array of given size n x n y. However, there can be multiple such arrays which gives rise to a volume. CNN takes as volume as input and assigns that volume to a particular class class label based on your objective function. So, since we can rasterize these images, so we can read out these pixel values one at a time and form a vector and then why not we just go ahead and use a, a regular artificial neural network. Now, if these images are small, let us say if you have a 32 by 32 image or let us say 30 by 30 image just for the sake of calculation. So, you have a 30 times 30 image uh, even uh, there are 3 channels. Okay. So, nine, so this is basically uh, 2700 input neurons for a regular ANN. Okay. So, you will have about 2700 neurons. However, most regular size images are of the order of 220 or 256 times 256 and if you have 3 channels. So, this is already of the order of 10 raise to 4 and 10 raise to 5 neurons. Okay. So, which means that if you are taking let us say if you want to get a hidden layer of 1000 neurons which will give rise to 10 raise to 8 weights. This is a very conservative estimate because sometimes the images are as large as 1000 by 1000 or 512 by 512, especially medical images are quite large. So, as the size of your input images increase, ANNs do not scale very well. So, they uh, we are unable to handle such the number of weights or uh, there is the explosion in the number of weights that, that, are, that has to be estimated. We use the ANN that means that proportionally a large number of data points are required. Another aspect uh, of why we should not use ANN is because ANN once because ANN takes as input a vector. So, which means that even if you are given an image we have to vectorize it by rasterizing it and in that process we will lose the spatial structure of the data. Okay. So, images have spatial structure. 
So, which is what we want to exploit by using a CNN and in the process we also as we saw earlier uh, exploit two more things we get a sparsely connected network which means that there would not be there would not be as many weights as in an artificial neural network. In addition there is also parameter sharing which again reduces the number of weights and the parameter sharing which in turn enables that us to exploit the, the local connectivity of a neural network. sorry I, uh, the parameter sharing enables us to exploit the local connectivity in an image. So, what does the CNN consists of? Okay. A CNNs like ANNs consists of sequence of hidden layers, but these hidden layers are basically convolutions or pooling. Okay. So, we will see what these are in later slides but it is a it is a um, alternation of convolution and pooling layers followed by a series of fully connected layers just like in an artificial neural network leading to a classification layer. This is a typical structure of a, neural of a convolutional neural network. Now, why do we have this kind of structure? What is this convolution doing here? What does it mean? What does convolution accomplish? We will examine that. Okay. Uh, before we go there, we will also look at just to summarize. CNNs take as input as we saw earlier images, but these images can be uh, can have multi channels. So, a simple example being a RGB image which has three channels. So, they take as input a volume and <coughs> in each layer in, in, a, in a CNN outputs a volume irrespective of whether it is a convolution or a pooling layer. Okay. Which is different from contrast to ANNs where every the output is based of every layer is basically another vector of neurons. So, just to summarize again in visual form a, convol a convolution layer takes us so in this case uh, the input is an RGB image and we will not we will not know we will not uh, look at what the operations are right now, but the output from a layer is basically a volume here where if you can slice the volume this way. then have multiple uh, outputs or a multiple 2D outputs, these each of these is a 2D map. Each of these 2D output output is often referred to as a feature map or an activation map. So, the number of output feature maps or the activation maps is entirely within our control, we will see how that can be defined okay. and the size the, uh, the 2D map, the size of the 2D map the NX, NY coordinates of 2D map again is determined by the operations we perform. Similarly, even for a single input channel, so this is for 3 input channel, so irrespective of the size number of channels in your input, you can have multiple channels in your output this is true of every layer. So, for instance if you take this layer this will this can again undergo another convolution leading to even more a higher number of uh, activation maps being output, we will see that in some popular uh, CNN architectures later on. So, why convolutions, why do you, or what do these convolutions accomplish, what are they inspired by, we will look at what exactly convolutions do, but before that. So, in the 1960s uh, Hubel and his colleagues did uh, and his colleague did a series of experiments uh, measuring the activations or signals from neurons in the primary visual cortex of cats. Okay. We will not go into exactly how they did the experiments, but uh, these are biologists they knew what they were doing, uh, they eventually won the Nobel prize for this work. And they found out that in the primary visual cortex. The primary visual cortex in turn uh, as we see later will takes its input from the retina, retina is where uh, what we see is projected. So, our eyes the lens of our eye projects whatever we see onto the retina. So, the primary visual cortex and the signal from the retina goes to the primary visual cortex. Uh, so, the primary uh, visual cortex they found out have two types of cells, neuron cells. The simple cells, the simple cells of course, get their signals from the rods and cones in the retina and these simple cells respond to edges, 
So, they had very good response to edges of different orientations and it was a linear response. Okay. Um, and then there are other type of cells called complex cells which seem to take input from the simple cells. So, a linear combination of input from the simple cells and had a non-linear response and one aspect of which was that it was insensitive to translations. So, you can move an edge across the eye or have a project an edge on the retina of the eye and move it across the retina, but the output from a complex cell would be the same that is what it means. So, uh, they, they concluded that this the, the visual cortex had these two type of cells and uh, this behavior they characterized. Okay. So, this was the inspiration for, so if you want to look at it, so this let us say is your eyeball and this is your uh, retina right here. The simple cells here take as input signals from a particular region. This is the this is a region, a small region here for this cell. So, this is called the receptive field of that particular cell or group of cells, receptive field. Okay. So, what it does is it does a linear combination of the signals from the receptive field and provides an output. Okay. Similarly, there are a bunch of these simple cells each has its own receptive field in the retina of the eye and they in turn provide an output and this complex cell takes a weighted combination of these inputs and provides a, a output and it is non-linear output okay, from these cells. Okay. So, this, this is the uh, inspiration behind CNNs. So, they try to mimic this vision system, this is of course, the uh, general wisdom that goes around, but uh, of course, we, uh, there is not a very good understanding, that there is a lot of progress on this field on how vision system works, but this is a very simplified, should I say a cartoon version in my case, uh, that is what I have done here, cartoon version of how uh, the vision system works. So, another way of looking at this is why do you use convolution is that uh, if you go back to uh, signal processing or you know conventional image processing techniques, uh, it is well known that if you have an image, we can define filters or what you call kernels. Okay filter or filter kernels as they are called, which if you operate on an image should be able to extract different features from it. So, in this case I have shown a very simple kernel say, say one, one row two column is a one cross two filter kernel. So, all you have to do is superimpose it on the image. So, this is one and minus one multiply with the underlying pixel values and add them. And we can see that by applying this filter kernel and, and of course, translate and do the same thing everywhere. Okay. So, if you do that all across the image, then you will get the edge map. Now, it is possible to construct by hand different filters like these, which will highlight edges at different orientations. So, there are a multitude of filters. Um, so, for instance, there are Sobel filters or Pruitt filters and so on, which have been already been there for a, it is well known in image, traditional image processing literature that these filters can be used to highlight edges in an image, which is very similar to what we saw with how the simple cells work is basically we move this kernel. So, the receptive field for this kernel is about 1 cross 2. Okay. So, we can make 3 cross 3 Sobel filters. So, the receptive field for that filter is a 3 cross 3 region in the image. Let us say if we define a, uh, a 3 cross 3 pic, uh, filter, then this will be the receptive field of the filter. So, the idea is if we define enough filters, then we will get a variety of edge maps. This is just one layer, the first we can call this the first convolutional layer. And then we do more uh, combinations of those edge maps to get maybe higher order descriptions of your image. Okay. So, what these kernels, filter kernels exploit is that the edges 
in an image are similar everywhere. So, for instance, if you have a vertical edge somewhere in an image in one region of the image, let us say there is a edge in this case there is a edge here. I have a similar edge here too, their orientations are different right. So, you can or I can have an edge here which is very similar to the edge that I just pointed out right now this edge here and this edge here are the same very similar right. So, if I define a filter that picks out an edge at that angle let us say that is a 45 degree edge then I can use it all over the all over the picture to, to highlight that particular edge ok. So, this this is what this parameter sharing is all about is in the sense that for every for a, for identifying a particular feature I do not need to define a new filter for every region in the image the same filter that I can apply for and wherever there is a edge at this particular angle that filter will pick it up ok. This is another way of looking at a convolutional neural network ok. So, so what do convolution what does so what does convolution accomplish? So, like we like we saw the convolutional neural network same structure as artificial neural network there is an input layer followed by a sequence of hidden layers and then there is output. Now, the output of any hidden layer and for in general the, uh, the you can you can think of uh, an input input as also as a layer in the network. So, the output of every layer the neuron in the output of every layer is connected uh, to a small neighborhood in the input ok that is what that is that is what the convolution kernel accomplishes the filter kernel we saw in the last slide that is what it accomplishes. And the connection is through a weight matrix which we call the filter or a kernel ok. For every convolution layer we can just define multiple filter, filter kernels and the way it works is that we move the filter kernel around the image and at every region and at every position that we move it around to we multiply with the, with the underlying pixel values and add them up ok it is a sum of products and so which gives rise to a corresponding output. The, so, that since we can define multiple filters in every layer, we can stack the outputs of each of the filters by obtained by applying each of the filters to the input and giving rise to a, another volume of hidden neurons. So, let us just look at how a typical convolution works. So, let us just look at how a typical convolution works. So, what we see on the left here is your uh, just a toy image you can call it it is a 5 by 5 image and on the right is your um, 3 by 3 convolutional kernel ok. So, how does one actually perform the convolution that is what we are going to see it is very simple all you have to do is superimpose the convolutional kernel um, starting at some point at the, at the top left part of the image you can start from anywhere typically top left part of the image multiply so this will be 1 cross 1 times 1 plus 0 times 1 plus 2 times 0 plus 1 times 1 plus 2 times 1 so on and so forth and you multiply and you add so it is a sum of products of the corresponding elements the element uh, that which means that so you, uh, uh, the corresponding elements in the image with the filter weights. So, that gives rise to one element in your output feature map. Next step is to slide the kernel to the right or by one by one pixel and perform a similar operation. We can keep doing that because once we hit the edge of the image. So, now if you go in any further then the filter will not fit completely the Im in the image. So, we will stop there and then we move one pixel down and then continue to do so and at every point we place the kernel we multiply with the underlying uh, pixel values add and then obtain the output corresponding output there. So, as we move through we see that at every position we perform the same operation and again once again as you come here if you go down any further if you move the, the shift the filter down any further then the it would not completely it would not fit inside the image. So, we stop right there. So, in general if you have an image or input of size n x times n y and your filter kernel is of size f x or f y, um, your output size would be n x minus f x plus 1 
and n y minus f i plus 1. This is a basic output. So, you see that as we as you do the convolution, the size output size keeps decreasing. Okay, this will happen. There is a way to stop that, we will see how to how that is done in more systematic way. Uh, but this is typically what happens when you do convolutions. So, we at every convolution layer, you will define a multitude of these filters. So, when I say define, you really do not know. So, because these are the weights. Like in a, these are similar, these are the equivalent of the weights in your artificial neural network. So, that is what we typically estimate in artificial neural network, the weights of the network by optimizing an objective function. In this case, we will determine the, the members of the filter kernel by again by optimizing a suitable objective function. So, at every layer given an input, we can define many such filter kernels. So, we define k filter kernels, k okay, can be any very large number. So, for instance, there are instances there are networks which define 5, 12 such filters in every layer. Okay. And so, you the output would be k feature maps of each of this particular size. So, typically in every layer, each of the filter maps are of the same size, even though there are exceptions which we will again look at later in later videos. So, typically you would also for instance you would you would one layer would contain you would define 3 by 3 filters about 256 of them all filters would be of size two, uh, 3 by 3. So, all the feature maps would be of the output feature maps would be of the same size, but they will be about k, k of them. Now, this another operation which we defined there was pooling. So, following convolution or a series of convolutions there is also pooling. What does this pooling accomplish? Uh, one of the uh, major uh, major uh, advantages it, it gives supposedly gives is the translational invariance. So, you can it is very easy to visualize. If you have an object in your picture and you are trying to localize it let us say using the neural network. Now, if you keep subsampling the picture let us say you subsample the picture from 256 cross 256 to 32 by 32 right almost a factor of 8. 8, uh, 8 reduction, factor 8 reduction, okay. but almost exactly factor of 8 reduction. So, let us say if the object moves around inside this image, inside the 256 by 256 image, if it moves less than 8 or 16 pixels, you will hardly see a motion in the 32 by 32 image. So, basically what uh, this pooling performs is a subsampling operation. It reduces the size of your feature maps and as you as you build more and more layers comes to a point wherein very large motion of so it the, the network kind of becomes invariant to very large motion of the object you are trying to detect in your main image. Typically average pooling and max pooling are commonly used. We will look at max pooling average pooling should be fairly obvious. So, let us say let us take this feature map of size 4 by 4, this is of size 4 by 4. A typical max pooling operation would be to uh, would be it is again you can think of it as using a kernel. So, you define a 2 by 2 kernel here okay. and what max pooling does is to look at the maximum value inside this 2 by 2 space right. So, here it is 6 and the way max pooling is done unlike we saw that for convolution you just slide the uh, filter kernel by 1, here you slide the you do not you don't have overlap. So, you would slide so that there is no overlap, you can also skip we will see that you can also stride and there is no overlap and then in this window it is 8 is the maximum. Similarly, here it is 3 in this window 3 and in this window 4 is the maximum, there is a typical max. So, we have it is so if you if you do max pooling of size 2 by 2 right with a stride in this case the stride is how many pixels do you move before you do another max pooling operation in this case you move 2 pixels. So, the stride of 2 sorry stride of 2 then you will half the size of the feature map. So, that is typically that is this is the uh, function of the max pooling. So, in very if you want to be very systematic about it, 
you would try to retain the size of your feature map when doing convolutions. We will see how we can do that and we will try to uh, any subsampling will be done during the pooling operation. For average pooling instead of the max value you will take the mean of the values inside this 2 by 2 neighborhood. So, we saw that we mentioned earlier that the, uh, the neural network the volume con volumetric convolutions or volume convolutions are done. Okay. So, what do we mean by that? So, because whatever we have seen so far we are usually defining the filter kernels to be of a just a 2 by 2 uh, as a 2 dimensional matrix right. So, for instance we have a this is a 3 by 3 filter kernel right. So, f x and f y. So, what do you mean by volumetric convolutions how does it work? So, let us take this particular example right. So, the input let us just look at the input layer it generalizes to all layers. So, the input layer is an RGB image we have 3 channels. So, RGB so, input is 3 channels ok. So, basically our input size is n x times n y times 3 ok. This 3 is each of them the r g and b each of them is channel, channel and each of them is an image. Now, when you perform a convolution, so let us say we define a 3 by 3 convolution ok do not uh, it need not be a 3 by 3 you can even do a 5 by 5 convolution just to prevent uh, any uh, if, you, if you are uncomfortable with 3 by 3 you can use a 5 by 5 kernel it is easy to draw that. So, this is your filter let us say you are doing a 3 by 3 convolution on your input image which has 3 channels. Now, even though we say 3 by 3 the, the filter itself would be defined as Three by three times three. So there will be a filter which operates on the red, green, or blue, green, and red. Each of them would be operated on by a three by three concurrently. Okay. So a neuron in one of the output feature maps is the sum of all these outputs right. So, we saw earlier so when we, if we go back to the slides um, back to the video you see that we saw earlier that where we superimpose the uh, filter kernel on a region at a location in the image multiply with the underlying pixel values to get one output. This is on a 2D feature map a 2D input and a, and, a, uh, and one filter kernel. Now, we have in this case 3 channels. So, the filter kernel itself is 3 by 3 by 3 if we had 5 channels as input then the filter kernel would be 3 by 3 times 5 with 45 here it is 27 values here it will be 45 values that we have tested plus a bias unit if you want to include the bias ok. This is the uh, this is how volumetric convolutions are done the, the filter acts across the channels or across the volume ok. So, in this case the output let us say we have defined k filters of size uh, or particular slice then it will give you k feature maps ok. Now, if I do a 3 by 3 convolution we are actually using a 3 by 3 times k con k times k size filter to operate on this feature map. So, it will be 3 by 3, but it will act across the feature maps. So, this is what we refer to as volume convolutions that it takes us the, the, the number of input channels can be variable. So, when you define so typically you will only define 3 by 3 or 5 by 5 filters, but it is implicit that those filters also act across the channels depending on how many channels you have as input. And it will the, the all the values in the filter kernel will be unique. So, um, in the sense do not think that if you define a 3 by 3 kernel let us say or in this case for simplicity 2 by 2 kernel let us say you define it like this something of that sort ok. So, this is not duplicated across the feature uh, across the channels right. So, if you will have so let us say if you have 3 if 3 input channels there will be uh, times 3. So, this is 2 by 2 times 3 this is the size of your 
uh, filter kernel and these have as many unique elements as determined by your um, backprop algorithm. Okay. So, their weights will be estimated that, that way. Okay. This is an important point to understand because uh, many beginners really falter here sometimes to understand this. Okay. So, how do we determine the size of the output volume? Okay. Uh, and what we, we have seen some hints so far, we will just, uh, just do it very systematically. See the size of the output volume or the feature map, it depends on the size of the input, we saw that. The size of the feature kernel, the filter kernel we are using, sorry. Uh, how much zero padding we do, we will see why we do zero padding and the stride in our network. Okay. So, padded convolutions, why would we want to do padded convolutions? So, we saw earlier that when we do a convolution with a when you did a convolution with the 3 by 3 kernel, the size of the output was less than the size of the input. Okay. Suppose we want to preserve this size, um, the reason is if you, uh, if you have multiple convolution layers, as we do more and more convolution at some point the uh, feature maps, the size of the feature maps will become so small that you cannot do any more uh, filtering. So, that it is actually acts as restrictions on, restriction on how deep you can go. Okay. So, in order to avoid that, we sometimes would like to do padded convolutions. So, all we have to do is, so if we go back here, so this is our input feature map size. Again, we will just operate with one feature map at a time. It automatically applies to a volume, input volume. So, uh, it is very difficult to show it on screen that way. So, we have a input image of size 3 by 3. Um, it is very simple. So, if you apply this 3, three by 3 kernel on this 3 by 3 image, your output will be 1 cross 1, that is typically what you get. But, but then you cannot do subsequent filtering on top of that, it becomes difficult. So, to preserve the size of your feature map, so you will pad it with zeros all around. So, this corresponds to padding of 1, which means that you will pad with 1 on the left, right, top and bottom of the picture. And if you do a convolution with this, then you see that your output, it is very similar to what we did earlier. You will position your filter kernel at the top left and then move it around like you would do for a regular convolution, except that now you have added zeros everywhere. But then by doing this, by adding zeros everywhere on the, on the edges, you get an output feature map of size 3 by 3. Okay. So, this is the idea behind padded convolution is that it helps to preserve the size of your input. Of course, it, you can add more zeros too, it will be just be a slightly larger uh, feature map we will get there, but uh, you can add more zeros too, but typically it is done to preserve the size of your feature map and enough zero padding is to is determined by the size of your feature kernel. So, so in general if you are uh, we will just use square uh, feature maps as input. So, if your size of your feature map on one axis is n, okay, we saw that if you use a filter kernel of size f, then the size of the output is n minus f plus 1. Okay. So, if you have a padding of size p, in this case p equal to 1, n minus f plus 1, uh, let us just write this more clearly. Right. So, your output is n minus the size of the feature kernel plus 1 n plus 2 p. Okay. So, in this case our original n was 3, our filter kernel size was also 3 plus 1, this padding is 1, so 2 times 1, so we will get 3 as output. Okay. So, if you want to preserve the size of a feature map following the convolution, then you would want 2 p is f minus 1 or p is f minus 1 divided by 2, which is the another reason why we would like our f to be odd. Okay, then it is easier to, otherwise you will get some fractional values and you have to do round or floor and several adjustments have to be made downstream, you can work through that. So, typically we will work with odd size filter, uh, filter kernels 3 by 3, 5 by 5, 7 by 7, so on and so forth, so that these calculations are simplified. 
another uh, operation that we typically do was sided convolutions. Again, we saw that with the convolution, the size of the feature map reduces. Um, however, it reduces gradually if you do, if you if you shift the feature map by one every time. Okay, so the stride of one is typically what by one pixel every time. The stride of one is typically what we do. However, if you have let's say very large feature maps and we want to subsample it quickly, otherwise memory becomes an issue. Then you do strided convolution. Uh, it's very simple. Strided convolutions are very simple to understand, except it's just that you skip a few pixels instead of trans instead of uh, moving the kernel on the image one pixel at a time. You would skip multiple pixels at a time and how many ever pixels you skip is basically the stride you are using. So, stride 1 is what we saw earlier is typically how you would go, but for stride let us say 2 we saw that for if you let us say you want to do a, a convolution with stride of 2 then we saw we usually start from the top left right here okay, and we just look that we, we skipped this okay, the stride of 2. So, it moved 1, 2 pixels and then you, you get the corresponding output there. Once again as you go down you will skip 1, 2 and you will position the kernel there and of course, you would do one more skip to get there. So, you are uh, typically you should have obtained a 3 by 3, a 3 by 3 output, but because of the stride you will get a 2 by 2. Okay. So, the general formula for stridded convolution again giving the size of your feature maps is n square n you know that n minus f plus 2 p divided by the size of your stride plus 1. Okay. So, in this case it is very easy to verify your input was 5 as 5 feature map the filter kernel size is 3, it is no padding stride of 2 plus 1 you get 2, it is a 2 by 2 feature maps the output. So, you subsample very quickly typically okay. you will work you typically work with you know odd sized uh, odd, odd numbers uh, filter kernels 3 by 3 not odd numbered filter kernels sorry the size of the field kernels is pretty odd number. So, it is convenient to make these calculations because you have to make sure that, um, that at some point you do not run into these fractional values and it will be difficult to resize your feature maps at that. So, we typically work with this um, odd sized filters so that it enables you to do these calculations and end up with whole numbers rather than fractions. Okay. So, to, to summarize briefly what you have looked at so far looked at convolutional neural networks we see that they have uh, they are they are made up of a, a sequence of convolutions and max pooling layers leading to a fully connected layer and a decision layer convolutions are basically uh, done by defining filter kernels at every layer in your network so every layer you will define k filter kernels and the convolution is done by moving the filter kernel across the image and at every point multiplying with the underlying pixel values and adding to get a get the output. Max pooling is done to reduce the size of your feature maps. So, we repeat these layers eventually leading to a fully connected and a decision layer. So, we have not seen those yet. Um, I have also not mentioned that there is a non-linearity there of course, because this is a neural network. So, following a convolution you will usually do a point wise non-linearity. So, what do I do by that mean by that let us say for instance, so in this case I have done a convolution with a stride I would take these values. So, this is what you would typically see in your uh, ANN as a W transpose x right, where in this case W is the or the elements of your uh, filter kernel and the x comes from the pixel values here. So, you would pass it through a non-linearity like a ReLU for instance. So, at every uh, 
activation in the output feature map will be put through a non-linearity. So, that layer is, is always there. So, convolution followed by a non-linearity is typically done, it is a usual thing. So, you have a, so if, if in the, in the uh, deep learning parlance you would call it a linear layer which is basically um, W transpose X as we saw there, so you just uh, sum of products followed by a non-linearity. So, convolution non-linearity followed by max pooling and so on. So, this is typical uh, sequence of uh, operations that are done in a convolutional neural network. So, uh, we will uh, in the next few over the next few videos look at a typical construction of a convolutional neural network, see what the layers are, how we define these layers, how we would um, you know define uh, number of kernels in every layer and what it would look like and how we would progress to let us say a fully connected layer and then to a decision layer or can we skip the fully connected layers or not that is another uh, aspect that we would like to look at. So, that this we will cover in the next few weeks of lectures.